contact family. Welcome to Church Online. We're excited you guys are here. This was unexpected, but numbers are increasing, and so we just feel that it's more safe to uh, continue online service. So we're going to be doing that for a little bit, and we'll keep you guys posted on if that changes. But we're excited you're here. We have a great message lined up today with Jonathan bringing us a message on the Minor Prophets, continuing that series um, about justice and what God has to say about that. And we also have uh, Ron doing praise and prayer and Lord's Supper and uh, just hope you guys enjoy this service. We love you guys. We miss you, but uh, we're excited that you're here, and we pray that you just uh, would be blessed today. Enjoy. We'll see you guys in the comments. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the me when I'm broken, strength where I've been weak and forever He will reign. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. Heals me when
Contact family, it's time for today's memory verse. We're going to continue with our memory verses on justice. Today we're going to be in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 89, verse 14. So what we're going to do is like we usually do, we're going to walk through why we're doing the signs we're doing first, and then we'll do it with repeats, and then we'll do it all together. So here we go. Psalm 89, 14. Here we did this last week, remember? Righteousness, sign of righteousness, and justice. And then because we've just done this, that kind of looks like a foundation. We're going to scoop down to the bottom of the foundation. And it's hard to do throne, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to do a crown. Or your throne, okay? We're going to do steadfast love, or love, you know, love. And faithfulness, which is two letter Fs. This is F in sign language. Faithfulness. And then what you're going to do, this is the really tricky part, okay? With one hand, you're going to switch your F into an L. You're going to say, go before you. So faithfulness and steadfast love are going before you. Okay? All right, let's try to do it again with your piece. We'll see if I can do that because that last move is really hard. All right, Psalm 89, 14. Psalm 89, 14. Righteousness and justice. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness, steadfast love and faithfulness go before you, go before you. Okay, I kind of got some time to think about it that time, so let's see if we can do it all together. You ready? Okay, Psalm 89, 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. All right, guys, good job. Psalm 76. God is honored in Judah. His name is great in Israel. Jerusalem is where he lives. Mount Zion is his home. There he has broken the fiery arrows of the enemy, the shields and swords and weapons of war. You are glorious and more majestic than the everlasting mountains. Our boldest enemies have been plundered. They lie before us in the sleep of death. No warrior could lift a hand against us. At the blast of your breath, O God of Jacob, their horses and chariots lay still. No wonder you are greatly feared. Who can stand before you when your anger explodes? From heaven you sentenced your enemies. The earth trembled and stood silent before you. You stand up to judge those who do evil, O God, and to rescue the oppressed of the earth. Human defiance only enhances your glory, for you use it as a weapon. Make vows to the Lord your God and keep them. Let everyone bring tribute to the Awesome One, for he breaks the pride of princes, and the kings of the earth fear him. The Word of the Lord. Good morning, Contact family. It's Sunday morning. We're getting to worship together. I know we're not in person again and we're online, but I'm so glad that you're here today. I'm so glad that we're going to get a chance to continue studying the 8th century prophets and what the message that they brought to Israel and to Judah says to us today in our world, but most importantly, what it says to us today in our family here at Contact and in our neighborhood. So, Let us talk about 8th century prophets. I want to remind us of the goals of this series. So we got four goals, and each one kind of builds on the other one. First is we want to get a basic understanding of justice, righteousness, and the 8th century prophets. So that kind of means, you know, we haven't really talked about these a lot, that I'm hoping that when this is over, you can, like, tell somebody what justice is, what righteousness is, and something about the 8th century prophets, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah. Second, to identify how these relate to Jesus' day, the gospel, which is the good news that we share to others, and our current world. And that's something that's very important. That middle point is really important, is that this this is foundational for good news that we're telling to other people. So this isn't meant to be, I know last week was pretty heavy, but this isn't just meant to be a beat down. This is meant to be how we live out God's message into the world. And so that's good news for others. Third, we want to discover ways that we personally and as contact need to shape our lives to submit to God's way. There's some things that we're going to learn in here that maybe we've done in a way that we shouldn't have done, and we need to change how how we are. And so that's something that we want to do because we want to be more like Jesus. 
And last, we want to intentionally step out of our comfort zones to engage others with righteousness and justice. So it starts off as just basic understanding and then learning and it growing deeper and deeper into our lives to the point where it comes out of us as we walk around in this world. So those are the big goals. So we're going to continue with Amos. This will be our last day in the book of Amos. Last week, if you remember, there was another picture here, and I had the picture of Isaiah on the Amos slides. So sorry about that. This is Amos. You can see he's a shepherd. It's one of the things we talked about last week was he was a shepherd from Tekoa, uh, which is near Jerusalem. So he was from the southern kingdom and went up to the northern kingdom of Israel to preach. So with that being said, let's kind of catch up. So uh, we did chapters one and two last time. I'm going to give you a little overview of what's in chapters three and four. It'll be really quick. And we're going to spend most of our time in chapter five and touch on chapter six just slightly. We're going to look at like two verses from chapter six. So in chapter three, uh, one of the things that God says in this section from verses three to seven is that he is not a reactionary God. God has announced his intention beforehand through his prophets. And so nothing that's happening to Israel is just coming out of the blue. They're not shocked and surprised. I mean, they are shocked and surprised because they thought that they were impenetrable uh, and that they were the greatest place even though they were doing what was wrong. But they'd already been told before this. Second in verses 9 through 11, he calls the nations as a witness against Israel. So unlike in the in the first two chapters, you remember we looked at the map and we saw all those different countries that God was issuing a, a challenge against and saying these countries are doing something wrong. Here in these, these verses, those countries come back and they even say, you guys are really messed up. In chapter 4, verses 6 through 11, it's not just that God announced that these things were coming. God has already done things to try to turn Israel back to him. And over and over again, no matter what he's done, they haven't listened, which leads to this verse that is one of the, like, when you really hear it in context, I think it's one of the scariest kind of verses in the Bible. This is chapter 4, verse 12. God says to Israel, prepare to meet your God in judgment, you people of Israel. Can you just imagine what that would be like? For God to say, like, you know, we said the phrase, like, meet your, get ready to meet your maker or something like that. Like, that's basically what God is saying to Israel, his people, is it's, it's coming. You guys have been weighed and you've been found wanting. So, with that being said, we're going to look at first the first 17 verses in chapter 5, and then we're going to finish out chapter 5. So we're going to read all of chapter 5 today. And this section uh, has a very beautiful poetic structure, which we'll talk about at the end. And it's called, uh, the Lord is his name, is a phrase I want you to watch for, which will be right smack dab in the middle. So listen to this, hear what God says to Israel. It says in chapter 5, starting in verse 1, Listen, you people of Israel, listen to this funeral song I am singing. That's not a good start, right? The virgin Israel has fallen, never to rise again. She lies abandoned on the ground with no one to help her up. The sovereign Lord says, when a city sends a thousand men to battle, only a hundred will return. When a town sends a hundred, only ten will come back alive. Now this is what the Lord says to the family of Israel. Come back to me and live. So even in this, even though he said, get ready for judgment, here's what he's saying here in verse 4. Come back, come back. There's still a chance. Come back, listen to me. Don't worship at the pagan altars at Bethel. Don't go to the shrines at Gilgal or Beersheba. For the people of Gilgal will be dragged off into exile, and the people of Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Come back to the Lord and live. Otherwise, he will roar through Israel like a fire, devouring you completely. Your gods in Bethel won't be able to quench the flames. Okay, what are they doing wrong? You twist justice, making it a bitter pill for the oppressed. You treat the righteous like dirt. It is the Lord who created the stars, the Pleiades, and Orion. He turns darkness into morning and day into night. He draws up water from the oceans and pours it down as rain on the land. The Lord is his name. What's he saying there? God's saying he made things. He put things in order. So he has the right to tell you what is right and wrong and what is just and what is unjust. The Lord is his name. With blinding speed and power, he destroys the strong, crushing all their defenses. How you hate honest judges. How you despise people who tell the truth. You trample the poor, stealing their grain through taxes and unfair rent. 
Therefore, though you build beautiful stone houses, you will never live in them. Though you plant lush vineyards, you will never drink wine from them. For I know the vast number of your sins and the depth of your rebellions. You oppress good people by taking bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. So those who are smart keep their mouths shut, for it is an evil time. Do what is good and run from evil so that you may live. Then the Lord God of heaven's armies will be your helper, just as you have claimed. Did you hear that? All this stuff is going on, but what's he saying again? Do what's good. Stop doing evil, and then you'll get to live. Then God will actually help you the way you've claimed that he will. Hate evil and love what is good. Turn your courts into true halls of justice. Perhaps even yet, the Lord God of heaven's armies will have mercy on the remnant of his people. You remember Micah, our every verse from a few weeks ago, Micah 6, 8? Do justice, love, mercy, walk humbly before your God. Look at that, God's, God's talking about justice and mercy together here again. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord God of heaven's army says. There will be crying in all the public squares and mourning in every street. Call for the farmers to weep with you and summon professional mourners to wail. There will be wailing in every vineyard, for I will destroy them all, says the Lord. That's a, that's a hard thing to hear, God talking to his own people that way. And it's hard because when we hear that, we say, man, I mean, we hear some of what they're doing, but we know we've done wrong too, and we're like, oh, I don't want to hear God saying those kinds of things to me too. I want to just put it way back in the Old Testament and say that's not something that's happening now, but then we look around us and we say, man, things are not good in so many places. There's so much things that look like that, trampling the poor. I mean, we see that all the time. And so we know that's around us. And so we say, man, what is God thinking about what's going on right now? And what is God wanting to do right now? And that's one of the big questions that we have with this. And that's part of why we want to talk about these things. So the slide you've got up here now, it says Hebrew chiasm, which is an X. Key uh, is actually a Greek word, the Greek letter for X, key or chi. Uh, and so we're talking about a Hebrew chiasm here. So if you look at the structure, and if you go back, you can map this out, and you can screenshot this or something if you want to, if you really want to go mark up your Bible with how this is. And you can see that there's a parallel structure. So we talked some about parallel structure in poetry. We talked about chiasm actually before when we were working on the Psalms. But you'll see that the, the top line, verses 1 through 3, and then the bottom line are both laments. And then you have the second one, seeking God and avoiding destruction, seeking good and obtaining mercy. So they're parallel. Then it's a warning to sinners, both times in verse 7 and in verse 10 through 13. Then the power of God to create and the power of God to punish are contrasted against each other in verse 8 and verse 9. And in the center of all this is this phrase, the Lord is his name. Why is the Lord is his name the thing that's here in the very center. Why is that so important? Well, if you remember back in the story of Israel, back early on, one of the big things in the Exodus story is Moses asks God at the burning bush, who am I to say sent me? And God says, I am. And then after they get out of Israel and they're giving the law, there's this time when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai. And at the same time that he's, uh, that he's receiving the law, the, the people of Israel are, are sinning before the golden calf. And at this time, God comes before, before Moses and he explains who he is. He says, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, faithful for a thousand generations, but not leaving the guilty unpunished, and that the third and fourth generation will suffer for the sins. Now, all of that is why is this the center of this verse? And it's because... Who God is, God's name represents who God is before his people and in the world. And because the Lord is his name, because Yahweh, the I am, is his name, God must bring punishment on his own people because of the way they have broken the covenant that they should have been keeping with God. So that's, that's a rough, rough thing, right? Okay, so we're looking next here at Amos chapter 5, still in chapter 5, going verses 18 through 27. So this is the back half of the chapter. And the question it says there on the slide is, what do you think of when you hear day of the Lord? 
Uh, now, in Israel's time, this was a common phrase that they had already started to see a little bit. And this phrase for a lot of people was this thing that they were like looking forward to because it was the day when God was going to knock out all of the enemies. This is the day when God was going to destroy all of the other nations and make Israel the, the big, powerful nation that was ruling over everyone else is the way that they were envisioning it. Uh, but what we're going to find out here is that day of the Lord really means something more along the lines of day of reckoning. Uh, and we think now, you know, more about the phrase like judgment day. And remember, you maybe you played the game of life. We had the game of life growing up, and you would go through the whole game, and then you get to the end, and it would be the day of reckoning at the end. And you would either end up, once you totaled up all the things you collected in the game, uh, you'd go to the, the rich place or you'd go to the poor place. Uh, and and it's this idea that, that everything is going to be accounted for here at the end. And so the people who looked at this as something that was going to be really great for them, and we're going to see that Amos shows a little bit different picture and shows that they have kind of just straight up missed the point. Let's read from chapter 5, starting at verse 18. What sorrow awaits you who say, If only the day of the Lord were here. You have no idea what you are wishing for. That day will bring darkness, not light. And that day you will be like a man who runs from a lion only to meet a bear. Escaping from the bear, he leans his hand against a wall in his house, and he's bitten by a snake. You hear the kind of dark humor in that? Yeah, he's running away, then running away, and then gets home only to be bit by a snake that kills him. Yes, the day of the Lord will be dark and hopeless, without a ray of joy or hope. That's a scary thing. So now listen, here's God. He's going to level the, the big thing against them. And this is something that you might have heard before. One of the verses that we've had here was one of our memory verses. This is one of the lines that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. uses in the I Have a Dream speech. This is a really, really important line in the Bible. God says, I hate all your show and pretense, the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice all your choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Okay, so all that stuff, that's all the stuff about the worship and what God wants in worship. And God had commanded all of these things and how they were to worship him. And so they're saying, I don't want those things because instead, verse 24, I want to see a mighty flood of justice, of justice, an endless river of righteous living. And then he finishes saying, was it to me you were bringing sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness of Israel? Remember, this is going back to what they just talked about when he's saying the Lord is his name. This story right before they're wandering in the wilderness of worshiping the golden calf. No, you served your pagan god, Sakath, your king god, and Kawan, your star god, the images you made for yourself. So I will send you into exile to a land east of Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of heaven's armies. This is a sobering thought for the people. This is a sobering thought because it really lands on that they've been missing the whole point. They've been missing everything that they were supposed to be actually doing the way they were supposed to be as God's people. So that leads to the big question for us. And that question is, how does God want us to worship him? Does God hate our assembly? Does God hate it when we're in the church building singing together? Does God hate it when we're here online worshiping? And I would say, well, that's a complicated question because it's, it's not just about what happens when we gather together to worship. Gathering together in worship is a very important part of what it is to be a Christian, but it's part of how we get together to praise God for the way he's led us in ways of justice and righteousness through the rest of the week and love and faithfulness and all these other words that are so important to God's character that explain how we are to interact with the world around us. And if we're missing out on those things, then the things that we do on Sunday don't really matter that much. They really have no purpose or value because we have not understood the God that we are trying to worship. Because if we really understood the God we were trying to worship, our behavior, our actions, our hearts would go toward those in need, those who are vulnerable, those who are poor, those who are hurting, those who are broken. So with that, I want to read one verse, one pair of verses 
from Amos chapter 6. So the first part of Amos chapter 6 is kind of more of the same kinds of things, more of a rehash. And then he uses this kind of sarcastic line uh, that I think is really interesting. I'm reading from the message because it is clear. -er. And so it says, Do you hold a horse race in a field of rocks? Do you plow the sea with oxen? Any of you guys know anything about, you know, horses or farming? You know, yeah, you don't want to have a race in a field of oxen. You cripple the horses and you drown the oxen. And yet you've made a shambles of justice, a bloated corpse of righteousness, bragging on your trivial pursuits, beating up on the weak and crowing, look what I've done. So what God's saying here, and God's big issue that's coming out is, Again, you've missed the point. You're doing things that are totally illogical, totally don't make sense with the way that I made you to be a people. And then you go further than that and you brag about it. You're not even doing it in secret. You're saying, look how great I am for the way that I'm treating others. Look at all the money I've made off the backs of the poor. Look at all the way that I've abused others so I can get what I want. Look at all the ways that I have used power to hurt others. Look at all the ways that it's always been me first and my group first, instead of being like Jesus talks about later, and being for the benefit of others and serving others. Okay, so, big question one asked. This is a systemic question, it says. Think about this. We're not going to really answer it. Uh, but is how a society treats the poor, remember that's those without power, is that a good assessment of the spiritual health of that nation or community. So as we're talking about all these pieces, is the way that the society as a whole, and we can think about this on a smaller scale, is the way that the church, that contact, treats the poor or the people without power a good assessment of our spiritual health? I would, I would say that it almost certainly is, because that's some of the things that Jesus did so much. Some of the people that he went to, the people he went to the most were the people who were on the outskirts, the fringes, the people who were hurting, the people who were, were in situations that, that were needing help. And that's how he showed us he wanted us to be. Now, one of the things we want to talk about with all this and we've talked about is, what does it say, what does Jesus say about this? How does Jesus relate to these things? So I'm going to read to you, uh, this is in all four of the Gospels. There's a story that you're probably familiar with, is when Jesus goes into the temple and he turns over the tables. I'm going to read you the account from Mark. It's three verses. It's going to be in Mark chapter 11. It says, When they arrived back in Jerusalem, this is Jesus and his disciples, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, The scriptures declare... My temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, Isaiah 56. But you have turned it into a den of thieves, Jeremiah 7. Why do we bring that, that up? We, we bring that up because that's Jesus living out what we just read about in Amos, right? Is, is Amos says, I don't, God doesn't want this kind of worship if there's no justice and righteousness. God wants that. And so what's going on in the temple at this time when Jesus comes in? Well, people who are poor, who don't have, you know, the right animals in their flock because they don't have enough money to have them, have to go and pay this exorbitant fee to get the animals for their sacrifices at the temple. And instead of it being a place where people are working to help others worship God, it's become a place where people take advantage of others and make money off people. And create systems of power and hurt that that destroy the people who are weak instead of, and this, this is the temple, this is the temple, the place where people go to commune and worship with God. And Jesus is like, you're, you're missing this. You're totally missing the point. This is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, a place where all can come to worship God, but you are robbing the poor. So one more question, and this will take a second. It's got two parts. What are we, contact, what are we doing individually and collectively to bring justice and righteousness to our community? What are we doing individually and collectively? That's one of the big things that we've got to take away from this 
is, is one, obviously justice and righteousness are a huge part of God's story and what God desires for us and what Jesus came on the earth to bring. Remember, that was the first, the first week, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He's called me to do these things from Isaiah chapter 61 in Luke chapter 4. And, and so the second thing is that it can't just be about what we do on Sunday morning because that's, that's not enough. That's not enough for us. That's not enough for what God's calling us to be. So what does he say about this? Uh, boy, I just went in a circle there. What, what are we doing about this? And, and I think that it'll be helpful if we look again at the definitions of justice and righteousness that we used a few weeks ago. So remember, righteousness is an ethical standard that refers to right relationships between people based on the idea that all people are made in the image of God. So how are we creating right relationships between others? How are we showing others what it looks like to be humans that are made in the image of God, that are redeemed, that's us as Christians, by Jesus to be even more full of life and full of what God made us to be than the majority of people are? So how are we showing people that? And second is justice. How are we seeking out and helping vulnerable people who are being taken advantage of, including advocacy and systemic change? So from all levels, how are we helping those around us? How are we doing things together? And so that's what we want to sit on and what we want to really think about. And maybe in the comments, you can you can put something that maybe you've had the chance to do this week or that you've seen uh, contact as a group do. Or maybe you can point out some things that we that we need to do more and that's that's the other big part of this is it's not just what are we doing now but how can we grow because we want to make sure that this is a place contact is a place contact is a community that is built on the right foundations and that is serving others our memory verse today this is this is perfect fit right here is that uh what is it righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne, is what we said, right? Righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness what was that? go before you. And so that's, we're, we're people that are following God's example. And so righteousness and justice are these foundations, and then love and faithfulness go, go ahead. And so that's the kind of community that we want to build, a community that is uh, a church, a fellowship, a body, that is built on God's justice, God's righteousness, God's love, God's faithfulness. How can we grow in that? So if you have ideas, this is this is a back and forth. This is something that's going to be a project that we go through until all of us are long, long buried. Because we want to keep on working on this. We're never going to be perfect about it, but we can take huge steps and we can be more and more on the path. And that's an exciting and a great thing. There's always new ideas. There's always new ways that we can become more and more like Jesus. So I'm, I'm excited about this. I hope that you feel more positive after this Sunday than, than we did maybe last Sunday. And that you're excited about thinking, man, yeah, there's been ways that we haven't followed through on this calling that God has given us. And if that's the case, then man, like, let's pray about that. Let's find ways to recommit ourselves to God and to Jesus and to, to following him. But there's also wow, we really need to open our eyes and and we have such opportunity to get on the path of serving and loving and offering justice and righteousness into the world around us. And thank you, God, for choosing us to be the community of people that you want to do that through. So let's pray, and then we will continue on with our service. God, we are so thankful for today. God, help us to get it. Help us to not be putting everything about the way we do Sunday morning first, but to put the matters of justice and righteousness that you want flowing like rivers and streams that are never ending. God, help us to be the kind of people that love justice, that do justice, that love mercy, and that walk humbly before you. God, open our eyes to new ways to serve. Open our eyes to become more and more like Jesus, and to see the needs around us, and encourage us and excite us individually and as a group to help and to love and to serve in this world that you have given us to be stewards of. God, may your kingdom come on this earth. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Contact family, I love you guys. See you next time. Everyone needs compassion.
passion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. This morning we want to reflect on the Lamb of God. To think of the Lamb of God, when John the Baptist introduced Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 29, and he said, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And then he said in verse 36, again, the Lamb of God. And it really connected with uh, literally thousands of lambs that have been slain on Hebrew altars in ages past. And the significance of all of those slain were united with the cross of Calvary. And But this one, the Lamb of God, he was God's Lamb. And he was a Lamb whose death God had planned and arranged. And that's the beauty of the Supper, that we get to remember and significantly partake and not just eat the bread, drink the wine, but the planned arrangement. And the history of, of all the lambs that were slaughtered under the Levitical order Two lambs were slain every, one, every day, one in the morning and then another in the evening. And seven were offered at the beginning of each month. And during the Passover, the lamb was sacrificed in a, in a Hebrew household. And nine lambs were slain during the Feast of Pentecost. Seven were sa sacrificed during the Feast of Trumpets. And seven more were slain on the Day of Atonement. And during the Feast of Tabernacles, seven lambs were slain for 14 consecutive days. A thousand were offered at the coronation of Solomon and 30,000 more at the Passover 
and the celebration, the coronation of Josiah. And yet, there's only one Lamb of God. Christ was not a victim. He was a volunteer. And he volunteered that sacrifice. And every lamb offered in sacrifice had to be without blemish. And in the Lord's separation of the saved and the lost on Judgment Day, lambs are seen as pure. The significance of the broken body, the bread that we get to partake and remember of the Lamb of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the Lamb of God, the brokenness and the sacrifice and the commitment that we get to remember. And as we partake, not just as a loaf, but as a, but as a commitment, as a sacrifice, as a honor. And thank you, Father, for that commitment. Thank you, Jesus, for being the Lamb. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 7 and 8, He was oppressed, yet he was afflicted, and he opened not his mouth. As a lamb that is led to the slaughter, as a sheep that before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And he poured out his soul unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the intercessor. He bore the sins of many, and after that he was raised from the dead and ascended at the right hand of God, and he was seen as a lamb standing as though he had been slain. In Revelations 5, verse 6. As we celebrate the memorial feast and remember the blood that was shed on Calvary, in honor of the Lamb of God, Let's remember the blood that flowed, that flowed as rivers throughout history, and that it was then culminating the precious blood of the Lamb, as a Lamb without blemish, without spot, even the blood of Christ, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we get to remember the blood that flowed, and really the blood that was without blemish, the Christ without blemish, the lamb without blemish, and the significance of the fruit of the vine that we get to commemorate and remember. Thank you for that sacrifice, and thank you, God, that we get to remember today, and we honor you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Man, this blessing we have to get to pray to and trust our Father. What a wonderful blessing that we get to play. It's always encouraging to hear many more soldiers that are prayer warriors. Keep praying, family, and others, because there's always opportunities to pray. You know, it's neat to hear people praying four, five, six, eight times a day. And that's uh, that is powerful, isn't it? We want to remember Big A. Big A is... Uh, some of you guys call him Arlen. Arlen. But anyway, he has a son that's uh, got a health issues, big time health issues that's affecting his balance, his speech, and of course his attitude. And so far the doctors are at a loss out of helping. He traveled to St. Louis, Missouri to, to see a physician that it took him a year and a half to even get in to see him because he's supposed to be one of the best. And now they don't even know. So I want to pray for Big A and his son, Rob. Katrina Alexander says, I want you to pray for her auntie. She's going to have surgery July 14th. And the auntie also is a very diabetic lady. She has a lot of struggles. So keep praying for Katrina, her son, her auntie. And she says, I love and miss everyone at contact. <clears throat> Dale says, Pray that all will be blessed today. Gina May says, pray for our, and praise for our recent rain. Amen, church. That was a blessing, wasn't it? And also prayers for the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. 
the Tulsa Police Department, all the patrol officers and the frontliners and all the people that take care of health issues and health battles every day and how they give their, their total heart and their commitment and thankful for she and her mom, Gina May and her mom, Erlene, was able to take a trip and safe travels in during that time. Also, Holly says, please pray for Susie, pray for Sherry, and pray for Ox and Glenda May and Billy. Let's pray together, all right? <clears throat> Father, thank you. Thank you, God, that we know that you are already listening and ready to hear from us. And Father, that is great assurance and great confidence that you give us knowing that you listen to our every feeble word and every feeble thought. God, help us to, to remember how blessed we are because of the avenue of prayer and the avenue that we get to trust you more. Thank you, God, for listening to us. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my feeble words and presenting them to the Father in the Holy of Holies in that holy room, in that throne room. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells and guides us every second. God, we want to pray for Big A and Rob, because I know Big A hurts for his son, and I pray that the doctors will find out what's going on to take care of this good man. And God, for Katrina and her auntie and her son, Chris, and for the surgery that's coming up, and I pray for success of that, and that is a tough call for back surgery. And God, for Dale, and he is thanking God for all of us to be blessed and then for the church. And God, what a great request and a prayer request from Dale. Gina May is praising you, Father, for the recent rain and also for the prayers for the, for the Popo, the Oklahoma Highway Patrol, the Tulsa, Oklahoma City, patrol officers all over this land and how they now have a lot of fears that once were not there how they put their life on the line and how nasty continues to show up. And God, please protect them. Protect our firemen, our emergency personnel, paramedic, doctors and nurses, and everyone taking care of the frontliners. Thank you, God, for their attitudes and their hearts. And thank you that Gina May and her mom, Erlene, had some safe travels. And thank you that uh, they arrived home safely. Holly says, Keep praying for her sisters, Susie and Sherry, and their families as those families are hurting and struggling. Pray for Ox, and that Ox will listen to you and submit to you. Pray for Glenda May as she's carrying a baby, and uh, that uh, this pregnancy will go well with her. As a mom, take care of her, God. But Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for listening, and God. Please bless the contact family that we all glorify you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Keep thinking souls, family. We'll catch you on the rebound.